who are just joining, we're just waiting a moment for um, all of the participants to join. We'll um, be uh, starting the meeting shortly. Okay, um, good morning everybody. Um, I think we'll still continue to see some participants joining, but we would um, like to start the meeting. It's uh, two minutes after 10. Um, and uh, we are really excited today to be presenting the first um, in our uh, Merging Technology Speaker Series. Uh, we had um, planned, of course, for this year to have a large uh, in-person event uh, in the fall, uh, that will be delayed. Uh, and in the meantime, though, we felt that it was an opportunity to continue to bring uh, information to our local companies on, if, on um, technologies that might assist uh, in their efficiencies uh, and how they manage um, their um, organization during, particularly during this time. So um, we are uh, today partnering with Volteric, um, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Karen Plunkett. Uh, Karen Plunkett is the Vice President of Business Development and has, uh, has been uh, in the Windsor area for a long time. Uh, many of you might recognize her. She's a leader, an entrepreneur, um, and a strategic planner. She was the former CEO of a regional um, uh, uh, the Regional Innovation Center, and uh, has been driving, um, if, you know, uh, the, the region uh, forward for many years. So thank you, Karen and um, Scott, for joining us today to present. Uh, Karen, if you'd like, I can pass it over to you to introduce Scott. Great. Thank you so much, and good morning, all. And those not in the morning, uh, good day. Um, thank you for joining us. Very um, interesting time, so I hope this finds all well. Um, what has been more, and, and again, thank you to Windsor Economic Development for inviting us to participate and, and have this discussion. We have learned that the amazing amount of data that's out there in these changing times, and it is rapidly becoming awareness that there is very much in, information within that data. We would call them data lakes, if you will. And Scott will speak more into that later. But the importance is finding and digging down in what that data um, is important in how it drives efficiencies within our within our companies and, and the world, frankly. Um, it's global and Volteric is a global solution. So uh, again, we're excited to um, share and, and talk about um, this as an example of how we need to be drilling into our data more effectively. So I introduce Scott, who is the, um, the mastermind um, and CEO of Volteric and he'll, he'll draw more and talk more about, specifically about that as well. Thanks, Karen, um, and thank you to the uh, Windsor Economic, uh, Windsor Essex Economic Development for this opportunity, and uh, thank you all for for participating and taking the time today to uh, to join us for this uh, this presentation. Uh, as Karen said, I'm the uh, president and chief software architect of Volteric, and we're a software company uh, that delivers IoT data management, uh, monitoring, analytics solutions uh, to this new and very exciting uh, time and in the, shall we say, Industry 4.0 uh, world. Um, and what I wanted to do in today's presentation is give a, a little bit slightly deeper than a overview of uh, what IoT Industry 4.0 is, uh, the data and data management implications of that, uh, how these things can be uh, used for process optimization, then a little bit of a case study. Uh, at the end. Um, in reality, any of these uh, three uh, it, topics can be a webinar on their own. They're, they're, they're huge, uh, huge topics that are revolutionizing um, uh, society, really, but uh, industry in particular for the purposes of this presentation. Uh, so again, it's going to be more of a, of a, not just an overview, but try to go a little bit deeper, but by no means a deep dive. And um, possibly in the future, we'll be able to do some, some more uh, webinars that are more specific to, to dive deeper into each of these, uh, each of these topics. 
So I want to start with a, a very brief history of what people are calling or what is now being branded about as, as industrial revolutions. And uh, I'm not going to do a whole first there was nothing kind of speech here because that's going to be boring and we've probably all heard elements of it before. But I did think it was important to try to uh, give some context to, to how the term industry 4.0 even came about, what it means uh, in, in the context of everything else we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so. Again, industrial evolution, kind of a relatively new term, at least is how it's being used in, in the software and uh, industrial technology uh, realm. And it's being used as a way to describe uh, large changes in the way that industry has worked, even though these revolutions, as they're being, as they're being talked about, it really have expanded sometimes 80 to, to 100 years. But what they all have in common is that they've brought about a significant change in, uh, in society uh, but also, obviously, the economics uh, of, 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 uh, of doing business in industry. Um, and a lot of times it's changed the way that the world has uh, interacted uh, with industry uh, and uh, the political and, and economic consequences uh, that those changes during this revolution brought about. So the first one as they, is the first industrial revolution. And this was uh, when hand production started moving to machines. You know, this is talking about everything from no more hand stitching and now using sewing machines, uh, going to uh, steam and water power to uh, drastically improve efficiencies and uh, improve uh, production capabilities of everything from, you know, distilleries to textiles, uh, weaving, uh, processing food, all of these things were, were dramatically changed by, um, by steam and, and water power. Uh, this one usually is, is thought to take about 80 years. And it is probably when some people believe the, the real industry, industry became a, a, a term in of, it, of itself. Um, the mechanization of, of, of labor uh, was a huge change uh, to to society and to the the livelihoods of of pretty much everybody on 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 the planet to one degree or another. But started this chain of uh, constant improvement um, and and constant increase in wealth, at least for 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 large parts of the world. It led to the second industrial revolution, which is roughly from 1870 to about 1940. And this is where we see our first technical revolution. So it's, it's building upon the idea of, of steam and water power, changing the way that we work with our hands to something that when our machines are helping us do this. So now we're starting to get more advanced technology that's starting to get layered on top of, of these processes. So um, railroads and, and, and telegraphs. Uh, obviously, elect electricity was a huge one, to say the least. Um, and now we're starting to see industry and the people that work in industry and the people that use the output of industry, their communication, their ability to exchange goods and exchange ideas and exchange uh, um, materials is dramatically increased. Um, and as a result, we're seeing more machines, more advanced machines, uh, more people coming into the industrial workforce. Um, and a, a further acceleration of all of these technologies and mechanizations starting to uh, have a greater impact on, on society. Um, and of course, near the end of this Industrial Revolution, we also have uh, World War I uh, and its impact on, on industry, a war-driven economy, uh, but also the political upheavals that happened during World War I uh, a lot of the monarchies falling apart uh, and and society uh, experiencing certain some parts of a society especially in the western uh, hemisphere starting to suffer uh, to certain degrees um, uh, economic consequences uh, for the war and societal consequences uh, of what's happening which started bringing into the third industrial revolution now, this one's pretty pretty long uh, pretty pretty long <laughs> revolution as far as us breaking down to four industry, uh, four revolutions. But this is what they term the, the digitization. Um, and this came about again, not because of the factors have happened in World War, World War I and the, the constant improvement of, mechan of, of mechanization, but uh, factors with 
new uh, the assembly lines, for example, and again, massive numbers of people coming into factories to start feeding this industrial uh, machine, if you if you will, of of uh, economic uh, development and and wealth. Uh, safety starts becoming more of a factor. Start seeing the increase of unions and 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 starting to really take seriously that. Uh, the, the environment and people's livelihoods and people's safety are just as important as doing uh, the the output of, of what these industries are, are, are putting out. Uh, we lead in then to World War II and the jump that that caused when it comes to transistors. Uh, computers start making their, their appearance with vacuum tubes uh, and, and, com and communications get even better uh, with the radio and we start seeing everything is accelerating uh, towards this digitization, but again, things are getting closer together, better communication, more rapid development, uh, better exchange, quicker exchange of ideas, and all the, the advantages that that, that that brings. And that, of course, leads into more machines, uh, better assembly lines, uh, better ways of, uh, better, better processes to uh, get more out of, of what they're, what's already being done. Um, like I said, it was a, a hundred year long revolution, if you want to call it a revolution of a hundred years. Uh, but a lot of these, especially in the last 40 years or so, have been a lot of mini revolutions that have been happening uh, basically in parallel. So uh, you look at uh, the, the advent of, of PLCs and HMIs on, on the factory floor. We have high level programming languages that are starting to, to, to get better and better and more, uh, more useful and easier to work with See these things like programming languages like C and C++ and, and uh, you know, even to modern day with, with .NET, but these programming languages that have become much more efficient at solving problems instead of, you know, sitting there with punch cards and, and doing machine level programming where a, a simple task uh, programming might take you three to four months of debugging now can be done by somebody sitting at a desk like I am right now in, in several, several hours. Um, We've got robots, right? Like the, the ones that came out in the late 70s, early 80s. I remember uh, seeing my first painting robot at the Chrysler plant in Windsor and it's just, you know, blowing my mind. And, and to, for me, that was when I first thought, you know, this, this is actually revolution, you know, the, the, the robots are coming. Um, and, and they were just doing simple tasks by today's uh, standards of, of, of painting, um, painting the, the, assembly, the, the assemblies of the cars. Uh, but again, better safety, more efficient, um, and seeing a glimpse of where things were going with, with robotic automation uh, and to, to, to where we are today and where we're going to be going in, in, in the future. Um, but like most things, uh, when they first started out, um, the robot, a lot of these solutions were, were isolated. There weren't a whole lot of robotics back then. Um, you really only the larger uh, you know, the big three factory, uh, big three automotive plants, some of the larger vendors would be using them. And even then they were usually very, very specific, very task oriented, and they were siloed by the companies that made them. Um, they wanted you to be able to buy that system. And, you know, you only had that system and you, you worked with that company only to deal with that system. Um, but with the advent of industry 4.0, we start seeing, and with the advent of, of the internet and everything else that there and market forces, which we'll get into, are causing all of these systems to now be more integrated together um, and work better together to create better optimization and better strategies. Um, and to adopt a little bit more of that open standard that the internet is, is, is known for, where you're no longer being siloed, but those silos are being broken down to create larger and better solutions. And that brings us to the fourth industrial revolution, or what is called uh, Industry 4.0, is in, 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 in some parlance, uh, the 4.0, the .0, I think just being kind of a cute way of taking advantage of the you know, 2.0 that we like to all say in, 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 in software and technology to make it say it's the next big thing. But fourth industrial revolution is commonly referred to as an ongoing transformation of traditional manufacturing industrial practice combined with the latest technology. Uh, that's pretty general term because latest technology obviously changes on a pretty much daily or weekly basis nowadays. But for our purposes, what we're talking about today, uh, the big um, takeaway from the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0 is the idea of, this, of the smart factory. 
There's actually many, many other parts of, of the, what is coined as industry 4.0. Uh, you talk about cybersecurity and uh, analytics um, and uh, uh, 3D printing is, a, is another one that's, that's usually associated with industry 4.0. But the smart factory is what we're, we're, we're going to be focusing on a lot more on today's uh, discussion. And it's a, a continuing evolution. So like most things, the term industry 4.0 is a little bit of fact, a little bit of fantasy, and, and a whole lot of marketing. Um, it was arguably termed first by uh, the government of Germany when they were looking for a way to kind of um, market, I suppose you could say, the idea of all these new technologies coming together to create a uh, cyber-enhanced uh, industry, uh, uh, a new way of doing things in, on the factory floor that brought together IOT and software and and new PLC technology and robots and uh, everything else, you know, ERP systems, everything that coming together to facilitate a more automated, more intelligent and more efficient way of manufacturing. Um, it's, it's characterized uh, as a much larger role of more advanced technology systems, but we're talking about software uh, software predominantly, but, but also uh, better communication through the internet uh, with bringing in other forms of data and uh, new devices uh, that aren't just robots, but sensors and, and uh, 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 information that's being processed by analytics software, like what we do at Volteric and all of these things coming together to have an immediate impact on the factory floor of optimizing how something is actually being produced. This is a little bit exciting, uh, just on a, as a quick aside, from a software perspective, because a lot of software companies uh, n never get the, uh, the tangential benefit of seeing something actually being produced by what software is doing, or higher level software is doing. A lot of it's very ethereal in that you write a piece of software program and it goes and does its thing and then it's deployed and somebody somewhere does something with it. So the industry 4.0 combination of software with, uh, with, with industry and with the, the hardware on the factory floor is actually quite, quite exciting, I think, for uh, all, of, all forms of IT and, and industry uh, together. But the core of all of this is that it's all being driven by data. Um, and where does this data coming from? Well, it comes from a lot of places, and that's one of the bigger issues that Industry 4.0 is, is, is bringing to the fore that needs to be solved to really eke the best benefit out of what Industry 4.0 is supposed to be able to deliver. So you can name a, quick, a few places where this data is coming from. From the hardware standpoint, you're looking at the PLCs on the factory floor, you're looking at uh, specialized machinery that are already in the last 15 to 20, maybe even a little bit more if you, if you IoT enable existing machinery that are already uh, spitting out tons of metrics and ton, tons of, uh, of data about what the machine is currently doing at any given time. And, and some of them even they're saying what they were doing at, in, the, in the distant past. You've got uh, sensors that are coming onto the market, uh, both ones that are embedded in the machines and ones that are stuck onto machines that are in the factory, somewhere on, on walls, on floors, uh, all over the place, wherever those, wherever those sensors could be. Um, again, smart machines from various vendors who, who aren't just sitting alongside existing machines, but are actually becoming part of those machines themselves. Now you've got the software as well. You've got uh, ERP systems or uh, enterprise resource uh, systems sitting out there in an office somewhere in the cloud that, are, that has all kinds of data in there. Uh, specialized process of business software that may have been built for a, a company over years or, or, or over time specifically for their, their business purposes or their, their, uh, their industrial purposes um, that may or may not be uh, capable of, of exchanging data, but very likely with a little bit of changes, will be able to exchange data. You've got existing SCADA systems, new SCADA systems, you've got CRM systems, the customer relation management systems, you've got BI systems like Salesforce and everything else uh, that has tons and tons of data about the business operations that are obviously very important in the grand scheme of things to what's happening on the factory floor. And then now you've got the internet, uh, various sources of information from the internet, including open data sources. So you've got historical uh, weather data, you've got open repository information from cities and countries. You have uh, publicly available information about uh, data sheets, about 
uh, PLC capabilities, about uh, pretty much anything, as we all know, is out on the internet. Some of them are paid, some of them are services, some of it's open data, but the fact is that that data is there ready to be used. Um, and we also got cloud-based platforms like, like, like Volteric and Open Automation and several other companies that are out there that work to bring all of these things together uh, to a couple of easier accessible points to, to make it um, more seamless to bring this data together for, for use on the floor. Um, so IIoT, what is that? And IoT stands for uh, Industrial Internet of Things, and it's a subset of IoT, which is Internet of Things. This is a, a, a some, something that's been around for probably in one term or another at least the last 15 years, uh, probably longer. Uh, it's a logical extension of the internet because now you've got this publicly available worldwide network that is there to be used by anybody for practically anything. And why not use that to start allowing uh, devices of any, time, of any kind to start talking to each other? Is that you've got the definition of an interconnected sensors, instruments, and other networks together with computers, industrial applications, including manufacturing, energy management. So it's, again, taking the idea of the internet of things uh, which is just another fancy term of saying a bunch of devices talking to each other over the internet or uh, you know, more secure tunnel over the internet, it was more likely, um, that are more specific towards uh, industrial manufacturing energy, uh, energy, manuf energy management uses. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a evolution of uh, distributed computing systems using advanced computing cloud-based uh, to elevate automation. Um, so the next question usually is, is all of this real, right? Like, is this just all a bunch of fluff? Is this all just another, like I mentioned earlier, just is this mostly marketing mumbo jumbo to try to get uh, companies to be able to sell you more stuff? In a certain degree, yes. But the, the reality is that this is a revolution. And I don't think I'm uh, in the minority by saying that. We, we, we've all seen certain elements of this already happening and it is starting to accelerate. The, the industrial internet of things is happening. It's, it's a major priority for many companies and if it isn't now, it will be in the very near future because it's something that's going to be required to remain competitive uh, with, within the market. Uh, those who aren't gonna be doing industrial internet of things to some degree or, or, or embracing some parts of industry 4.0, uh, might find it hard to, to to keep up with those that are simply because of the 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 improvements in process, the acceleration of 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 ideas and of technologies that are that are taking place. So much so that that GE estimates that forty six percent of the global economy is going to be able to benefit from from the I, from IIoT and just IIoT specifically. Um, CNN themselves estimate the factory automation led trillions of global economy. That article actually just came out a couple of days ago. And uh, the IoT market itself. So again, by IoT, they're even just really talking about more like devices and the actual hardware and how they communicate with each other. So we're not even talking about things like cybersecurity and edge computing and 3D printing. So just this one IoT market is supposed to expand to $933 billion um, by 2025. Um, so that's, I, would, I would say that that probably means that this is pretty, pretty real. So why is all this happening? Now, like like I said, it's seen the last 40 years, but we've all really started hearing more about Entry 4.0 and, and uh, IoT and these things only in the last 15 years or so. Well, before the, the vision of having all these systems talking to each other and, and, and optimizing these processes uh, was hampered by, by several obstacles. The, I've got the top, what I believe to be the top five here. There was, again, a lack of standards, silos, right? We're all very familiar with silos. Love silos in industry. They used to love silos in IT. Um, you know, back in the day, I had my old Commodore computer with my PC and my Apple, and none of the three would talk to each other. Uh, everybody wants to maintain their own, uh, their own market channel and their own vertical. That doesn't work in IT. Uh, there was a minimal number of centers on the market and those that were on the market were usually very expensive and didn't do a whole lot. Uh, they were there for a very specific purpose uh, and they were pretty unreliable. Um, there's forces of tradition, you know, they, they just, we have a process. Why would we change it? It's working. Uh, let's, I don't want to disrupt anything in order for something that might be worthwhile. Let's just keep doing what we're doing because it isn't broken. 
uh, there was physical barriers, you know, things like just wiring these things together uh, on a factory floor would have been a hassle, if not impossible in certain situations. Um, and there, it was costly to do that wiring as, as well. I'm talking electrical wiring, IT wiring, anything that would be required for those communications. Uh, and then the IT barriers. Um, the computer hardware just wasn't there to be able to do the kind of processing that would have been required. Uh, you would have had to have the servers on site. You would have had to have your own IT department. You would have had to hire people to come in and maintain those servers if servers are breaking down all the time. A lot of obstacles. Nowadays, not so many obstacles. And there's a huge industry, as we all know, that's around just removing these obstacles now. It's part of the industry 4.0. Uh, there's way more standards and much more cooperation between uh, vendors. Uh, and there's a lot more uh, mid, smaller to mid size, but very, very nimble players like Volterric and several others that are out in, in, in there working with these standards, creating new standards and bringing together co cooperation between uh, existing uh, people in, in, in the market to make these systems work better. There is no industry 4.0 unless these systems across the board can talk to each other in one form or, or another. Um, there's many, many sensors on the market now, and I'm using sensors in a very broad term. Again, you know, some of these sensors uh, or it might be built right into the machines themselves that are coming onto the market that some of you may already have on the factory floor right now. Um, some of them are literally off the shelf. You drop them on top of a, of top of a machine, and all of a sudden you're able to gauge temperature, you're able to gauge vibration, you're able to gauge in, in, um, uh, RPMs of, 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 of a motor that's there. All kinds of things you can just derive from those sensors and th from those three metrics themselves can be derived using things like like big data and analytic techniques. Uh, and you've got a whole burgeoning industry uh, of of make your own sensors, even if just for prototyping, right? There's a whole generation of, of kids <laughs> coming out of school right now that know how to work with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and I don't even so many different microprocessors that come off the shelf that you can that you can tap onto a onto a board and make a sensor that works with MQTT and and the and and wireless and start spitting out data right there. Um, there's market innovation forces, industry 4.0 marketing part of it being one of them that are driving driving this uh, driving this idea forward. Uh, physical barriers are being torn down. Wireless is now everywhere. Uh, you've got cellular, like LTE, right? And of course, we've all heard about 5G by now, uh, which is going to revolutionize everything again. Uh, you no longer have to be running cords of wires and, and, and everything around your factory floor to get these things to talk to each other. Uh, batteries now, a lot of these sensors don't even necessarily need to be hardwired to an electrical source. Uh, and there's better IT choices. You've got cloud computing, you've got um, much more reliable hardware processes. You've got uh, data centers spread out around everywhere. Uh, infrastructure as a service, you name it. So, uh, and of course the internet is common to, to all of these. This is the biggest driving force. The ability that now you can have a factory anywhere in the world communicating with, uh, with your own factories anywhere else in the world and those factories talking to other, other sources as well. So cloud computing is part of the whole industry 4.0. One, one of the main items along there with uh, edge computing and cybersecurity. And uh, what cloud computing can bring is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's cheap uh, way to bring on board almost an infinite amount, of course not infinite, but almost an infinite amount of, of, of computing power on an as needed basis without having anything installed on your own, uh, on your own factory floor in your own building and your own offices. It's up in, up in the cloud, really a data center or several data centers spread out around the world. But the point is that they're not on your floor with deal, being your problem. Um, it's brought about a whole uh, amount of cheap mass storage to store all this data we're going to be talking about. You can access it from practically anywhere. Uh, it's fault, fast, fault tolerant, distributed communication between uh, all these machines that are operating in the cloud. Uh, and it started a whole new paradigm of ways to do computing with IIS and, and, S, and, uh, IAS and SaaS, right? Uh, infrastructure as a service. So you're talking about uh, Google Cloud, Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, uh, many other ones, smaller ones out there that are making tons of their own money on providing cloud computing services from Fortune 500 companies all the way down to small startups. Uh, again, predominantly because cheap storage, cheap computing processes, scale it up, scale it down when you need to, no need to worry about an IT department. Uh, software as a service, platforms like Open Automation and Voltaire, you've got Google Apps, you've got 
um, Office 365, all of these software things that update automatically when they come up with a new version of the software. You don't have to install software on all your machines anymore uh, in, in your business. Um, you can pay monthly, you can pay yearly. Uh, it's, it's revolutionizing the way that people work with computers and certainly the way that businesses uh, do, do computing. So the consequence of all of this is data. And there's a lot of it. Uh, I'm sure many of you on, on, the, on the conference here are, are dealing with this very issue. Um, there's a lot of data already out there. We just talked about earlier on the slides before about uh, where all this data is coming from. Uh, and, it, and it's just gonna keep coming. Um, these newer IIoT devices produce a, a tremendous amount of data. Long gone are the days where you have a sensor that just tracks temperature once every five minutes. There's sensors now, including even the ones on our homes here in Ontario, the smart meters that are spitting out uh, data about um, voltage, kilowatt hours, uh, consumption, temperature. Uh, on the factory floor, you have one that's doing RPM for all the motors on the machine, temperature on various parts of the machine, uh, vibration on various parts of the machine. Uh, same thing, energy usage, like you name it. And some of these things are able to do this at uh, all the way up to nanosecond, uh, if not every, at least every minute. And you add all that up, uh, especially on a floor where you may have tens or hundreds of machines by maybe you have five or 10 factories, or maybe you don't, but somebody does. Uh, that's an, a massive amount of data that has to be stored and processed somewhere or else there's no point in having that data at all. Um, this problem in and of itself has spawned a whole new set of tech terms that we've all heard, right? You're doing blockchain, you're hearing about big data, you're hearing about analytics, you're hearing about uh, uh, data gluttony, data lakes, all of these things that are, that are meant to help uh, manage uh, this massive amount of data. And to process that data is a whole new set generation of acronyms. If you hear about AI, you're hearing about ML, you're hearing about OT, uh, we, we definitely don't have any lack of terms for internet and big, uh, or uh, acronyms and big terms in, um, in, in, in the software world. But all of these are, are uh, meant to try to grasp and the, 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 the problem of the massive amount of data that is here and, it, and is coming. And again, it's not about 5G, these, these things are, 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 this problem is going to get, uh, is going to get worse. Um, I personally think that data management is gonna be the next internet revolution. Talk about revolutions, I think before we had the, the internet was obviously a major revolution where computers started talking to each other. And then we had another revolution with uh, search engines starting to be able to see that you can find everything uh, and, and things getting, getting pumping data onto the internet. Now we have the data management problem. The, there's all this data, nobody knows what to do with it. It spawns a problem that I like to call data gluttony. And uh, it's the idea that someone's sitting there and probably you know, software guy or maybe someone who's a, who's a, who's a data junkie, data scientist, a new term. Um, and they see that there's just so much great information coming from here. There's just so much awesome information that all of these machines are, are, are providing us, right? There's all these great metrics. And, and, and you can do so much with it. There's just, there's just so much possibility with all of, these, with all of this data. And it's so cheap to store it all. We just have the cloud computing. You're talking about something like Amazon AWS can, is operating, I think the last time I looked was at a, a 0 0.03 cents a gigabyte to store information. Um, and and you, you, you're almost like, well, let's just, let's just store it all, right? What's the problem with storing it all? It's a problem because it becomes too much to track. And the reality is that almost a, a vast majority of it goes unused. At least in the way that things are right now, a lot of it goes unused. Um, I mean, this is caused, like Karen mentioned earlier, the, the idea of data lakes, where you start having these huge amounts of pools of data um, laying around that have just a tremendous amount of information in it, um, but so much so that nobody knows what's in there. Like they don't even remember what was put into this, you know, uh, six terabyte file that has a, all, all this information in it. Um, and even though data is cheap, uh, the exponential growth of data and tracking it for, as long, for, for many, for over the course of years, uh, it does drive up cost. Um, these infrastructure as a service ones obviously uh, charge based off of how much you're storing it for how long. So if you're not doing something practical with the data, eventually uh, it's going to end up costing more than it's worth because it's just sitting there uh, doing nothing. 
So how do we manage all of this data? Or what are some strategies for managing all of this data? Well, um, the, the first question to answer is what's the need? And that's not necessarily an easy question to answer. If it was, there would be no problem. Uh, and there is, a, as my younger daughters like to say, the, the element of FOMO, right? The fear of missing out, that if you don't track some kind of information that you might need it someday in the future. Um, but I think it's important to focus on the business problems that you have at the time, uh, the immediate need, if you will, of, of what that data can do for you uh, to solve any kind of immediate or optimization problems you might be experiencing at the given time. Um, so the, the, the problems or process of high importance are what you should be focusing on. Um, the data, like I mentioned earlier, there's an amazing amount of things that you can do with even just a small amount of metrics. With, with analytics and, and processing and some data science techniques, even doing things like vibration, uh, RPM, temperature, um, and, uh, and voltage, the amount of information you can process is, is tremendous. If, you, if you're looking at things like cycle times on machines or various temperature gauges on the way, you're already looking at probably years of, of, of optimizations that you can get out of those, that small amount of information. Um, but even if you did want to collect as much data as you can, there, there are ways to, to hedge against that. Um, and that's where you start looking at what's necessary to, to, to drive the, the optimization of goals. Like uh, many devices have a wide way of metrics and the resolution and detail is, is the key. You know, some of these things can do nanosecond temperature. Is there really a need, is it really a need for that? Probably not. Um, you, can, you can only, you can set up your data so you're only getting the finer points of, of, of what you need in certain situations uh, and cast a, 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 get averages or, or wider time frames for those that aren't going to change as, as quickly. Again, temperature usually being, being a common one if you're looking at environmental. And then, of course, your attention periods. You don't really, do you need to be holding on to data for a month or six months or a year or three years? It all depends on what, your, uh, what problem you're trying to solve or what optimizational goals you're, you're looking at. And you got how to store it. Um, you know, do you store the raw information or do you, do you pre-process it? pre-process it. There's uh, structured versus non-structured, but at some point this data is going to have to be processed to make it, to make it useful. Uh, there's ideas, there's, there's concepts of what we call data pipelines in certain, uh, uh, certain platforms where the data comes in on one, puts a copy of it somewhere to be used in the future, but processes it into different formats to be used by different endpoints or different, different optimization goals along the way so that someone isn't going back and doing this at, at some, other, some other point. Um, and then we've got where to store it, right? Do you store all this data locally? Do you store it in the cloud? Do you store a hybrid where it's a little bit, a little bit in both? And do you use a database in the file? What technologies are the best? Uh, again, this depends on what, what, your, what the goal is, but also what the capability of your sensors and, and, and the current data that, that, is, that is available versus the data that's coming in. And most of the time, uh, there isn't one solution fits all. That's what makes Industry 4.0 both exciting, a little bit confusing. Um, Back in the day, you would say, you know, well, I'm storing data, so I'm going to put it in a relational database. Um, nowadays, it doesn't work that way. You'll probably have one database solution for part of your data. You might have a NoSQL other solution for another part of your data. You might be storing some of it locally. You might be storing some of it cloud. The power of Industry 4.0 and all this interconnectivity is that they'll all still work together uh, when done properly to achieve the end goal, even if it's spread out over different technologies. Um, so I'm starting to run at a, at a time. Uh, so I'm going to go through these next couple of slides pretty quickly. But uh, I want to do a, a really quick word on IoT data collection and ed edge computing, which is another one of those uh, one of the, another one of those uh, uh, parts of Industry 4.0. But uh, most IoT devices can store data usually on an SD card, uh, but they're not very reliable. Um, SD cards have a have a tendency to kind of blow off to the side or, or blow up on their own. You lose the data. Um, but, uh, and they, they tend to be unreliable in, in relation to other uh, forms of computing. So this is where edge computing comes in. Edge computing is a smaller computer that sits in between your cloud or in between your, your office and the sensors to kind of collect data and make sure that the data is getting stored or backed up. Uh, and it usually has a more reliable form of, of, of hard drive on it to store that, to store that information. Um, this is another one of the industry 4.0 issues that, that we're going to be hearing more about in, in, in the future as, as, a, as a solution. Uh, so the data intake, we'll go through these really quickly. Uh, the data intakes are the data coming on the platform. The four things we talk about all the time are velocity, volume, veracity, and variety, which is how fast is data coming in, uh, how much data is coming in, 
is the data correct and how different is the data? All these have a huge impact on what you're going to choose to, to store the data and be able to process the data later and, and, and how good the analytics are going to be that you're going to get, get from those. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we've got that different database solutions, high availability systems, parallel backups, all of these things uh, are meant to provide minimal to no downtime in a cloud computing um, context. So I'm, I know I've been ripping through these slides, uh, but I think it, it, it proves the point that all of this is pretty challenging, right? The industry 4.0, again, is more of an idea about what can be accomplished with it using several different technologies, but it doesn't necessarily mean that using these technologies is, is very straightforward. It's, there are challenges to making these things work uh, in a way that's going to create real results and real optimizations on, on the floor. Um, there are platforms that, that tie all these ideas together to be able to present a solution more quickly. Things like Volteric, we have one obviously, that are with cloud-based and IS solution to do these things. Other platforms, Open Automation is another big one, that, uh, that greatly speed uh, the IO, IIoT and Industry 4.0 journey for, for a business um, to, to get started and, and, and achieve an end goal without having to worry about all these things uh, that, that we've talked about in this um, in this presentation. So the industry 4.0 goal, the big one, optimization. And, and, and this is a higher degree of automation based in cloud computing to refine and optimize the process, the cyber factory being the big one. So you're talking about further improving manual process on the floor, uh, optimizing, auto, optimizing automated processes uh, by information. So you use, but we're using real-time information or real-time analytics, you know, something that's happening now can that use automation to adjust something that's going to happen further on down the line because it's something that's occurring at that at that minute, not something being modified, you know, after the fact. Uh, improved maintenance decision, pre predictive maintenance, and uh, planning capital expenditure based on actual usage of those machines as opposed to how they were supposed to be used or how we think they're being used. And all of this is no good if you can't understand the data. So uh, you're talking about you know dashboards. Um, and proper reporting and, and proper automation practices to make sure that we aren't getting inundated by all this data. One of the big problems right now is that all this data gets thrown up and people can't use it because uh, they don't understand it. And this is where using correct dashboards and reporting and monitoring become just as important as getting the right analytics out of the systems. There's always gonna be people that have to, that have to be involved in this in, in the process and the better that they're informed and the, and the more sense this makes to them uh, the better it is for the end goal of again performing these optimizations and getting the return on investment of your your IOT that you're that you're looking for so very quickly I'm going to only go through some next one or two minutes we have a case study of what some one of the projects Volterix doing we're working on electrical tugs at a, at a major airport one of the uh, uh, top 15 international airports uh, we're doing a project with with them and these are uh, AI enabled energy conserving fast chargers uh, that work with the electrical tugs that you that you see at, at airports to do your your baggage and and uh, and um, move uh, move the planes around and it's an IoT solution that combines PLC sensor wireless cellular edge computing cloud computing it's it's got all the elements that we talked about today uh, being brought together to create a optimized solution for charging uh, vehicles. The basic solution is you plug the tug in, charges, it's great. But there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the battery and the system, and multiple chargers across an airport uh, have no way of understanding what each other is doing, and there's no insight into the energy use by someone who's using it. The IoT solution, uh, the tugs have an identifier that, of, of the battery, and the battery knows exactly, and the charger therefore knows what battery is connected to it and it knows what that battery is it's getting that from a database that that's up in the cloud and it knows exactly how to charge that battery at the most efficient way possible um, the batteries can be moved the database only has to be updated the plcs uh, inside are actually still doing all of the important work of turning the chargers off and on doing the electrical switching um, and, and all the safety that's a huge factor in plcs as we all know uh, is the safety factor, which software still cannot do. You need a PLC to be able to perform, especially the rated uh, and, and certified uh, safety requirements of these kinds of, of devices. And there's an edge computer in there that, again, tracks, takes all the sensor information, stores it on short term before it gets uploaded to the internet, and also provides us with a, with a, with a backup uh, system.
very rough uh, outline of, of basically how the whole thing works. The chargers are using cellular right now. The, the electric tugs themselves have a wireless where they also communicate with the cloud and, and with the edge computer. And Volteric, we're supplying the dashboards, the AI, the notifications uh, in a cloud-based uh, software as a service um, uh, offering. Uh, the cloud-based dashboard shows real time of where the charges are, where the tugs are, uh, historical energy use, uh, and eventually we'll be doing G GPS. But the, 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 the exciting part of it is the AI. And with that, we're able to show what, where the most commonly used stations are, where the vehicles are at any given time. Uh, the chargers power up and power down, not just based on predictive, but also based off of weather. They can, um, they can take grid power from here in Ontario and figure out if those chargers should be charging at a lower rate to reduce the, the, the carbon and energy footprint at the airport. Uh, notifications if something goes wrong. So we're, we're tying all these things together into creating a, a, a holistic solution from, you know, a, a battery on a vehicle all the way up to making intelligent decisions uh, for, for the airport. Um, so thank you all uh, for, for attending. Um, I apologize if I was ripping through that a little bit quicker than, <laughs> than I anticipated, but uh, I'll pass it back over to, to Lee for any, for any questions and uh, thank you again. Um, first of all, thank you, Scott. Uh, Wendy's going to be uh, moderating the question and answer period. If you have any uh, questions, please, uh, you have access to the Q&A chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we, uh, we were really uh, excited to be able to uh, hear this today. And Wendy, I think you have some questions that uh, have come into the um, conversation. Yeah, I just have a, a have a few questions uh, for Scott. Uh, first one is, uh, do you see cloud computing or IIoT in general replacing PLCs? Uh, no, uh, not at all. Actually, um, I I believe they have to work. Uh, they have to work together. Um, the 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 PLCs have evolved in a different way than, than, than software has. And what's exciting for me about Industry 4.0 is, is the combination of the two together. I mentioned in, in the case study about the, uh, the, the chargers have PLCs within them to actually do the, the relay switching, the safety mechanisms, the actual uh, hardware perform, uh, functions, if you will. Um, but you know, there's different program languages in PLC and software uses one that's different, but software can provide the higher level again, AI to help drive uh, PLC functionality. Um, and I really think that they're going to uh, evolve together into creating some incredible solutions in the IoT space uh, going forward. Great, thank you. Um, and second question is regarding uh, security. And that seems to be one of the things that's come out of the pandemic uh, has, has highlighted even, even more. Um, security concerns. So, what are the security concerns of IIoT? Yeah, and this is a this is a major part of Industry 4.0. Um, we could actually do an entire um, an entire uh, an entire uh, webinar just on cybersecurity, right? And uh, and um, and, and as well, I just saw another another question come in. There's that issue as well. It's been a challenge for Volteric too that when we talk to uh, people about IIT, you saw on that slide deck, you've got the cloud there, right? And of course, uh, there's quite a few uh, 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 larger companies, especially, who are like, hey, I, I don't, I don't, that <laughs> finger was very big. I don't like that, uh, I don't like that cloud there. That, uh, that makes me nervous. Um, the, a lot of white times that how we've got around that is uh, we've created VPNs or secure tunnels between um, the, the, the cloud infrastructure and uh, our IoT devices. And of course, using uh, the, 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 the common solutions, you know, uh, uh, encryption, SSL certificates, secure connections, all, all of these things. Um, but there's other factors of cybersecurity with IoT that comes down to more of identifying, you know, are the sensors that are talking to your network really the sensors that they say they are? Um, what happens if someone uh, a, a breaches your, your network? You know, what about ransomware? Um, uh, what, what, how are we making sure that, that the information that isn't getting hijacked? Um, so these are all things that are that a whole industry is starting to uh, build up around to to solve these these kinds of these kinds of problems. Um, right now, we're utilizing uh, all of the um, 
security uh, paradigms that are already uh, available to us, again, with uh, certificates to identify sensors and uh, make sure that, our, that our, our broker technology can actually identify who the sensors are. Uh, using specialized VPNs. Um, one of our customers uh, is actually, uh, because they want a higher level of security, is, is working with a major telecom provider here with us to have their own, uh, it's called an APN. So it's almost like a specialized network that sits on top of a cellular network that uh, does not use the internet. It actually uses a completely separate uh, part of the cellular network uh, from what we would do if we're on a, on a cell phone call uh, to give it that much higher level of, of, of security. Um, but this is something that's going to evolve uh, over time. Uh, you know, Wendy, like the question mentioned, it's, it's become a much more, um, I think, important topic or, or people are much more aware of that topic because of what's been happening coincidentally with Zoom and, and some of the other um, uh, things that have come up during, during the pandemic. Uh, but there are solutions for them right now and they'll continue to evolve and get better. Okay, so that and that sort of related, um, and I think maybe that's at least partially answered. The other question that came in was around uh, customers giving us access to the to the network, um, and asking about if there if there are any uh, strategies to convince the customer that this is a safe thing to do. Yeah, it's always a difficult uh, it's always a difficult um, conversation, really, or, uh, that that we found because you definitely don't want to do anything that's going to discount their their concerns because the, the concerns are real. And um, you know, the, the tier one customers um, they have a have a history of being very very closely closely guarding their their their, their data, right? And, and 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 rightfully rightfully so. There's as we said earlier in the deck, there's still a little bit of that um, idea. I think of um, of the, the, the old school way of, 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 of doing things. Um, we've, one of the strategies that we had was to, to start with a small amount of data in a very, very secure way um, and, and allow our customer to dictate to us what that data is going to be and how they're going to get it to, uh, how they're going to get it to us and still allow us to use it over, over a cellular network again, over this, over this APN. So it becomes a factor of saying, you know, it's in, instead of asking for the world and saying we want all the data right up front, we start with saying, well, let's, let's work on this one, optimization tech, uh, this one optimization goal. And for that, we'll need this small set of data. And, and typically, we try to make that data something that's not necessarily um, uh, uh, as proprietary or as sensitive as, as it may otherwise be. And we use that as a way to build trust with the system that we've built for the security uh, aspect, but also as, as deliverables of what we can do with, with that data. And we've seen in, in, in most situations that allows us to kind of open up a little bit more. Um, the, the great thing about some tier one customers and some of the larger customers we deal with is that um, once they see what the data can do, they tend to start working with us on building more secure, but more specific ways for us to get that data. So instead of piggybacking off the internet or off of, off of a cellular network, they become a little bit more open to the idea of saying, well, maybe we can build a different network, you know, going through, say, for example, a, a Microsoft Azure or, sorry, an Amazon AWS uh, VPN or Direct Connect is one of their services that, that they provide. That's for the exclusive use of our cloud computing. And it's a direct channel there like they do for some of their other vendors. Um, but usually we only get to that point after we prove that what we're doing actually is secure in a small, you know, almost pilot stage and that, it, and that it's going to work the way that we say it's going to work. So, uh, how would a company start uh, if they wanted to get into IIoT and they're if they're if they're just at square one right now? Uh, that's a great question. I, it, there's a lot of places uh, to to begin this this journey, if you if you will. Um, we've uh, we've seen at Volteric, we've been doing this for going on four years now, and the acceleration of of uh, of IOT practicing at companies has, uh, ha has started to really um, impress us. Uh, before our sales uh, and, and uh, we're more focused on just even trying to uh, convince um, companies that they should be doing IOT. Now we're talking to a lot more companies where we're getting into more into the data management aspect where they're saying, what well, I really like what, what we're hearing, what, what IOT and Industry 4.0 can offer. Uh, we already have all this data. Uh, can you start with that? Uh, which was one of the reasons why we chose to do today on the, on the data management aspect of it, because um, the IOT actually is now becoming more of a, of, of a, of, of a secondary concern to, to processing the data uh, right from the beginning. So 
I would suggest that they, they get in touch with somebody and uh, where they can discuss what their, what their goals would be. You know, obviously Voltaire would be a great choice, but what their goals would be going, going forward. And from there, you know, you assess what you already have, uh, what you may need, um, and what the path going forward is to, to reach those, those, uh, those objectives. And speaking a little bit to what the earlier slides say, we, we usually like to start with one or two very achievable high ROI goals uh, about uh, process optimization and look at the data that we already have that may be coming off the floor in all these software systems that already exist. And uh, if we need to supplant that with additional IoT hardware on the floor, we come up with a plan uh, to, to, to deliver that ROI as quickly as possible. And then we like to we say in software, we iterate. And then we can continue to go over that plan as we get results out of it and continue on this road towards optimizing even more processes and creating a more complex and dynamic solution in, in, the, uh, in the process. Great, okay, and the uh, last question is um, uh, whether it's possible for an attendee to get a copy of the slide deck. So I will say, first of all, that we will be sending a link to uh, attendees uh, for a record, to link to a recording of, of the presentation. Um, I just wondered if it's possible to get a, um, a copy of the, of the slide deck, I believe. Uh, yeah, I don't think that, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, maybe we can work with, uh, we'll yeah. work with uh, you and uh, Lee, Wendy, and uh, see if we, can, uh, if we can arrange that. Absolutely. So just, yeah, send, send one of us, uh, whoever um, asked the question, if uh, you'd like to send one of us uh, an email, we'll be happy to, uh, to get that to you. And that's okay. all we have, I believe, for questions. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. And um, I'd just like to take this uh, moment to thank uh, Scott and Karen for being such great partners on this, uh, this initial uh, Emerging Technologies um, speaker series. Um, we work in partnership with um, IRAP um, and uh, CAM and Automate Canada on Emerging Technologies. And uh, you will be receiving uh, further information on our upcoming series, as well as uh, the uh, virtual event that we will be holding uh, later in the year to replace the in-person event. Uh, looking forward to uh, when things return to normal to hold a in-person event for Emerging Technologies for 2021. Uh, at this time, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I did want to highlight um, for uh, Volteric is if your organization or your company is looking to um, make some changes and save on uh, electricity use or uh, consumption of um, uh, resources, please uh, feel free to reach out to Scott and Karen. Uh, they'll be able to help you with that. Have a nice day, everybody, and uh, stay safe. And we'll uh, see you on the next uh, round of uh, the Emerging Technology Speaker Series.